dark and distant drumming, the pounding of the hooves, the sounds of everything that moves. Late at night you see them decked out in shiny jewels, the coming of the caravan of food. Like the wings of a dove, the waiter's white glove seems to shimmer by the light of the food.
may be seated. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the path of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Greetings and welcome to the memorial service of the Honorable Grant Woods. On behalf of his wife, Mrs. Marlene Galan Woods and their children and family, your presence today, in person or virtual, is deeply appreciated. My late pastor's wife used to say of him, the magnitude of the man continues to unfold. And indeed, the magnitude of Grant Woods continues to unfold even today and will continue for decades to come. I am Warren H. Stewart, Sr., Senior Pastor of the First Institutional Baptist Church. Grant and I were members of a two-person mutual admiration society. <laughs> Our common advocacy of liberty and justice for all allowed us to be friends over the past 30 years in the realms of public life, our faith, and the arts. In many ways, Grant Woods was a white John Lewis. <laughs> yes. A white John Lewis, Congressman Lewis's most famous quote is this, my philosophy is simple. If you see something that's not right, that's not fair, not just, say something, do something, get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. And Grant Woods was getting into good trouble until the day he died. <laughs> I asked Marlene, what, what kind of feel do you want for Grant's memorial service? What kind of feel do you want? And she answered, Grant was a man of the Lord. Jesus would recognize him as a Christian. He loved his music, and it's got to be big. Because Grant was dead. So let's endeavor to move through this memorial service of Grant Woods today, being celebrative, sacred, sincere, somewhat serious, at times silly, and certainly sensational. With that being said, let us now Give the Honorable Grant Woods a standing ovation as we begin his celebration of life. readings by Lauren Woods Rogers, Kristen Price, Ava Marie Woods, and then Mrs. Lavinia Holmes, who is singing with the FIBC worship team, will sing a song requested by Mrs. Woods, Abide With Me. 
And I'll come back to lead us in the next portion of this celebration service. and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Thank you. 
thank God for his presence, not only in Grant's life, but in the life of his family, and in the lives of all of us who are here. At this time, it's a, it's a very special moment in this celebration of Grant's life. We will hear tributes by Grant Woodson in the order of Austin Woods, Cole Woods, Dylan Woods. And then there will be a video presentation, and Walter Richardson will come and sing Why Me. Jared Pepper will then lead in reading, reciting the Apostle Creed, which is in your program. And then Al Ortiz and Michael Nitro will sing right out the storm. And I'll be back to introduce those who will be leading, who will be delivering eulogies and others on the program. Hello, my name is Austin Woods. We come here today to bury Robert Sarver. Wait, what? <laughs> I knew I should have let ESPN write my speech. All right, I just wanted to do it when I came up with. This is obviously the worst thing ever. Um, it was totally unexpected. Um, we knew the Diamondbacks had a bad season. We had no idea they were fatal. <laughs> the governor has spoken to me and told me that we'll be filling in the stadium with boron and sand and sealing it with adamantium. That worked for Chernobyl and the X-Men. Should work for us. On the other hand, there's always next season. So that's the great thing about sports. This is a day of affirmation and a celebration of liberty. We stand here in the name of Grant Woods. Uh, I know what he would say. This is weak. The heck? 67? Is that Pat McMahon? He, he's got me beat on both ends. Start and finish. But I also know what he would say about the response over the past few weeks. In a word, wow. He would love this. My dad ran for one office, Attorney General, and he was only a politician for eight years. He left office 20 years ago. And yet the impact of his death has hit seemingly the entire state and far beyond. I learned early on going with him to conventions, NAG convention, National Associations of Attorneys General. They bring all the AGs together. It's a blast, you can imagine. <laughs> but I loved it because my dad was my hero. And, um, and I would come up to him and I would say, hey, I just met this guy. He's amazing. He, he, he's really fun. And uh, he must be a Republican like us. And my dad would go, that jerk? No, that's a huge problem, actually. Um, next meeting, I'd come in and go, oh, I was on the bus with this goof. He was quoting a Vonnegut book, and one of my favorite authors, and he was quoting the villain, as if he didn't realize, like, anything the author writes is good. He's quoting a, a villain character. That guy must be a Democrat, right? Actually, that's one of my best friends. Uh, and he's amazing, and he's fantastic. So, I learned early on, politics is not a team sport. And um, my dad was defined by the words love, wisdom, and compassion. He really did stand up for those things. And I think that that reflects our state as well. Um, I can look back in my life to another time where things sort of blew up for me when I was five and my parents got divorced. It was a time where things seemed uh, like there wasn't a great future, a very dark time. But, within a year, my dad met Marlene, my stepmom. And forget every weed cliche you've ever heard about stepmoms. Uh, she is incredible. She was the love of my dad's life. And it was an incredible thing that he met her. And a great thing for me, within a year, we had Cole, my younger brother, then soon came in quick succession Dylan, and Ava, and the family just kept getting bigger and bigger. And it was an extraordinary example of how things can look dark and within a year transform in incredible ways. Um, in my family, I can see my dad. With Cole, my oldest younger brother, a director, I see the leadership that dad had when he was attorney general managing 2,000 employees. I see that when I see Cole on a set directing people. 
When I see him giving advice to Marlene about her acting, I see Dad's leadership there with <laughs> good advice. She doesn't need much. Um, with Lauren, um, she has uh, brought, and lucky for us, she brought into my dad's life his grandchildren, Joseph and Lily, and he got to spend time with them before he passed. And with her, she has family in, in her blood, her ability to negotiate, which she uses in real estate. Uh, I know she gets from him. Um, Dylan is hilarious. Uh, my dad was a very funny person. Um, Dylan has uh, got my dad's spirit. Uh, he beats to his own drum, just like my dad did. And Ava, like me, got to spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one quality alone time with dad. Um, and, and she is him heart and soul. So you never know what life's going to throw at you, and that's okay. But you don't need to be afraid of the unknown. You don't need to be afraid of change. A lot of things in life are mind over matter anyway. I was lucky to know what true love was at a very early age because of my grandparents, Joe and Nina Woods, and through the people that my parents associated themselves with, like John and Cindy McCain. And I saw that with Marlene and my dad. My mom is amazing. She's here. But I have no idea why she and my dad got married. <laughs> I'm happy that they did so I could be alive, but I don't know what they're thinking. Um, But with Marlene, he found his soulmate, and I got a second mom who has always, always been there for me and whom I love with all my heart. If someone were to write out a list of all the people that Grant and Marlene Woods have helped, that would, that would be a very long list. And that is a tradition that she will carry on. Um, so I'm very proud of that. Dad made everything fun. It was like Steve Martin meets Robert F. Kennedy, which is an incredible combination. <laughs> and so I just decided I would follow him around and copy as much of him as I could. Um, and for example, on his second campaign, he ran unopposed. So he used the campaign money to make a short film starring Leslie Nielsen. <laughs> I think about a politician doing that. It's unheard of. It's legal too, by the way. And it's hilarious. Um, he would call in as active AG to KTAR and do prank calls. And, he'd be, and then be sitting in the car with him. He would literally call in, he'd be discussing some serious issue, and he'd pretend he had the wrong number. He'd say, uh, this is KTAR. What do you have to say? Oh, uh, this is uh, KTAR. We're calling for the Phoenix Blind Cleaners. What? Yeah, we need someone to give Ray Charles a bath. Can you help us? <laughs> and, and that would be on the air. He was, that was, he was amazing. He would do stuff like that every day. He made everything fun. He could make a ride in the elevator fun. Um, he also had the strongest moral compass of anyone I know. It wasn't about party politics. He was not about division. It was not about hatred, violence, or lawlessness. He was Attorney General, top law enforcement officer in the state. However, he executed that office with love, wisdom, and compassion. He protected our consumer rights suing Big Tobacco and our civil rights fighting for the Martin Luther King holiday, for which he was booed by our then legislature back in 1990 which is not long ago enough for that to have happened. I knew when I was in the seventh grade I wanted to be just like him, be an attorney, and it's uh, exactly what I did. Um, it was an incredible thing to get to work with him, have my own practice, he taught me how to have my own practice. We worked together on cases every year, um, but he taught me how to do it my own way, myself, which was, which was an absolute dream. His influence was massive. He stood up for people, I've had clients, I can tell stories forever here, but I've had people, I won't say who, but a company as big as Coca-Cola. I've had their lawyers come, somebody at the company made a mistake, it wasn't Coca-Cola. But somebody made a big mistake, the lawyers who were paid to fight these things regardless said, this is a big mistake, you guys need to just do the right thing. And uh, the company said, we, we just fight it, why are you... We don't know the local politics in Arizona. We're a big multi, we're a worldwide company. And uh, the attorney explained, you don't understand. Um, it's wrong, and when it comes to Grant Woods, who's the father of the attorney on this case, he always gets it right ethically. So if you guys aren't gonna do the right thing, we are going to resign as your attorneys. Leaving, attorneys don't quit big companies like that, ever. And they did it over a moral issue. So, that's the kind of, thank you. That's the kind of, 
power and strength that you can wield when you do great things every day, when you do the right thing, which is what Dad did. It, it isn't that complicated, as he said to me often. Um, <laughs> again, uh, he always did what was right. Whether it was politically savvy or not, he went after a Republican governor because we're Americans first. He worked with Democrats because politics is not a team sport, it is about people. He acted out of love, compassion, and wisdom, and fought every day against division, hatred, violence, and lawlessness. I'd like to close with a quote that he closed many, many of his speeches with. It's a quote from Robert F. Kennedy that he gave, speaking to the University of Cape Town in South Africa in 1966, at the height of apartheid. He wasn't asked to give a speech there. He went there on his own to learn, not to lecture. And uh, Robert Kennedy said, each time a person stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, they send forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. I believed in that. I know he believed in that. And he sent forth, on his own, a million ripples himself. And it worked. So. Thank you all for being here. I will be back. Sometimes it's okay to leave things left unsaid. And to any of you out there, anyone who feels like they left anything unsaid to my dad, I want you to know, honestly, I want you to know that whatever it is, that he knew it, and that he felt it. My dad, he had the best memory of anyone I've ever met. Anyone who knows him knows he had an incredible memory. I mean, he remembered every single person's name, every story, and he told our family about all those stories about you and with you. He remembered you. So the best thing you can do for him is the same. Remember him. Tell his stories. Tell his jokes. No matter how dirty or inappropriate they might be. <laughs> because God knows that never stopped him. You know, my dad was without a doubt my hero. And I think all of us, his children, can safely say that. It's a pretty easy question to answer in school. Who's your hero? My dad, he was passionate about a lot of things. And I love this about him. He was passionate about so many things. He was passionate about so much that one day his dad, my grandpa, came to me. And I still laugh about this uh, pretty often. My grandpa, after my dad's first play uh, that he produced out here, The Things We Do, my grandpa came up to me and he goes, I'm really worried for you grandkids. And I was like, why, grandpa? And he goes, because your dad is good at everything he does. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know why you're so worried, but, um, <laughs> you know, he was right. It made me laugh because it was absolutely true. And you probably all know that too. My dad kicked ass at everything he tried. But what you may not know, I'm sure you know, but what's hard for anyone to know is that a man with as many resources as he had, hundreds of friends, and the ability to spend his time in any which way he wanted, he chose to spend all of his time with us, his family. He wanted all of us together all the time. And sometimes I think God knows why, because we can be pretty tough, but he did. Every vacation, trip, holidays, he wanted us with him. He loved having us together. And he taught us quite a bit with his actions, the things he chose to say, and the things he chose not to say. You know, my dad and I, one thing that we had together, our thing that we would do, was we love talking about film, movies, books, and the art of writing. And that's what we spent most of our time doing together. Pretty much every time we were sitting down one-on-one, -on -one, we just loved to talk about, talk about writing. Talk about how we were going to crack the entertainment industry together. We would talk about lines from our favorite movies that we were kind of pissed off that we didn't write ourselves. 
You know, like lines, like Robert Duvall's line in HUD, where he said, true love never dies. True love never dies. And that doesn't matter if it's true or not. A man should believe in those things, because those are the things worth believing in. And we talked about how we were going to write stories about great characters, characters that were honorable, that cared about right and wrong, that fought for justice, characters that were true to the ones they love and would lay down their lives for those they loved. I mean, what real life person could encapsulate all those characteristics? I don't think we have to think too hard on that question. And I look forward to continuing the journey that we started together there. So, sometimes it is okay to leave things left unsaid. Just make sure they are felt. You know, my dad was a writer, and often for him it was easier to write his feelings. He was old school like that, and I love that about him. So, you know, if he, trouble, if he had trouble saying something to you in person, he would write you a letter or a text. You know, and my dad, he was not one to say I love you in person. I mean, he was cool as hell, but some ways he was pretty old school. And this was one of them. He just had trouble saying the words aloud. And I love that about him. I found it so showing about how big his heart was. And one day, in one trip my dad and I went on, when we had the best time, we went to New York. It was just he and I. He's got five kids, so, you know, the one-on-one -on -one trips, you know, when those happen really got to take advantage, and we had just about as great a trip as you can have. I mean, so much fun. And I'm talking drinking whiskey next to Sharon Stone, watching Aretha Franklin and Stevie Wonder kind of fun. I mean, we, we didn't even know why we were there, but we were just happy to be there. And we had the best time, and we got to the airport afterwards, and we're sitting there, and he looks at me, and I swear this made me laugh for years, and he looked at me and he goes, son, that was a great trip. I." And then he just freezes, and he's like, I go, yes, Dad, you have something to say? And he's smiling as he watched his family, manly cowboy face and bravado just struggle for the words. And he's like, oh, I just thought it was a great trip. And, and after I got off the plane, there was a text waiting for me that said, great trip, son, I love you. And, you know, it wouldn't have mattered if he sent the text or not, because he made it known through his actions and his unspoken words how he felt. So, you know, sometimes it is okay to leave things left unsaid. And I never got to say goodbye to my dad. I never got to say goodbye to my dad, but I didn't need to. Because when it comes to my dad, when it comes to Grant Woods, as long as this earth is spinning, it is never goodbye. I love you, Dad. for advice to, for how to deal with how I'm feeling, and tragically ironic, I want my dad's advice most of all right now. Um, I'm going to start with a quick story that my dad loved to tell, um, and the kids hated to hear it. Um, as kids, my parents uh, took us to the theater to see plays and musicals. We would all pile in the car, my dad driving, my mom in the passenger seat holding his hand, all the kids in the back seat. We would sing songs as a family the entire way there. One day, we went here to the Orpheum to see the musical Wicked. And as we're walking back, talking about the beautiful costumes and wonderful music, my dad and I, or my dad and mom are probably thinking, this is great, we're teaching them a little culture, a little class, a little civility, they need it. And then we get to the car and realize the back door is wide open. Mm -hmm. Right where those civilized kids sat. Um, my dad's thinking, good God. And every kid in this family blames the other for leaving that door open. <laughs> and if you ask me, I did not leave it open. Because I had a crystal clear memory of that night. And then my mom told me before this that we were at Gamage, not the Orpheum. <laughs> So it was probably me who left that door open. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Dad. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to do this without it. I'm so dumb. <laughs> he was so smart. Um, 
I've been asking that a lot lately. Uh, how am I going to do this without him? How are we going to do this? Can we do this? It seems impossible right now. And the only man who seemed to do the impossible was my dad. He loved his family, believed in us and our wildly improbable dreams. It takes courage to believe in us, trust me. If I had two sons who were like, I'm going to be a comedian, I'm going to be a director, I'm like, you're going to boarding school. <laughs> but that was the thing about my dad. He, he believed in his family. He believed in you. He believed in his friends. He believed in most everyone if they had it in them to try their best to be the greatest version of, them, of themselves. Um, I went into comedy because I, the most, the number one person I wanted to make laugh was my dad. And while it did take a while <laughs> to, to even master the intellect <laughs> uh, necessary to make my dad laugh, I cherished every time that I did. Uh, he was larger than life. He was the strongest man I know. He was the most influential man I know. So many people learned from him, learned from his actions, his beliefs, learned how to act in a hypocritical world. He could sway your political opinion without even trying. I'm going to have to pay attention to politics now, because I always just turn to him and I'm like, Dad, who do, you, who do, who do I vote for? <laughs> so, I would see people change their taste in music, in movies or sports to mirror his. I know I did, and I know my family did. Um, I love Norm Macdonald because my dad loved Norm. I love quesadillas because my dad loved quesadillas. <laughs> I love country music because my dad loved country music. I love Arizona because my dad loved Arizona. And I loved because my dad loved. So, while it may seem impossible to move on, I still have him in me. We all still have his love in us. We will all use those parts of us to make, make us stronger, kinder, and more caring. Because at the end of the day, all of us wanted to be more like Grant Woods. And if that's not changing the world, then I don't know what is. Thank you guys. Back in the driveway, the end of the work day, and how fast that world disappears. A fresh on a pine tree, a neighbor just like me, took all his life to get here. A man climbs his high. But his heart belongs where it began I can see in my mind's eye A shack on a hillside A lean billy goat on a chain Dad doing battle For the dirt hard as gravel Sing songs about Jesus all night And that's where I'm from Where time passes slower That's where I'm from Where it's yes, ma'am, no, sir Can't tell I'm country Just you look closer It's deep in my blood Two cars, a big fence, that's where I've come. Dirt roads and double wides, that's where I'm from. School on a fast track, no call 
single day, all that winter. I would bundle up in my coat and blankets because I wanted to be the first one there to greet her. It doesn't have to be some grand scale thing that you're involved in. What's really most meaningful is when you're just affecting average people. No question they can change the country. That void will be filled. If you're not there filling it, it will be filled by people who don't have anything better. That's what's been going on in this country. And we don't want them running the show anymore. We want a new spirit. We want people who, who have higher goals, who are more humane, who care about people in a very real way. That's where we need to take the country. And young people can help lead that fight. These things don't just happen. They only happen when people get involved. What's unique about Americans is we still hold those lofty goals that all people are created equal, that all people have the right to pursue their own happiness. And then nobody should get in the way of that. We get closer to that in every generation as long as that generation continues to fight for those goals and fight for this country. We need young people involved. They have to be. I'm glad I got to know Grant. He was a good man. check on Thursday evening yeah. as well. I said, great, I'll be there for that. He texted me back, hey Danny, how you doing? He texted me back again. I said, change of plans, Walt. Well. I said, okay. He said, I'm going to do it on Friday morning, 7 o'clock in the morning. I said, come again? <laughs> said, 7 o'clock load, uh, 7 o'clock load in, 7.30 sound check. This is Grant, right? This has got to be Grant. This can't be you doing this. <laughs> this man's a practical joker. I know this, right? So I said I'll be there. 
And uh, he gave me this song that the family wanted to hear. And uh, I remember this song when it first came out. I was in Florida at the time. And I thought it was a cool song then. And I'm glad to share it right here with you. And to the family, I know it's like to lose a good father. And, but I tell you, it's a great thing to have had a good father in this life. In this I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
thing I'm going to miss about Grant Woods the most is his childlike spirit. When I first met him, he, we sat down and we started working on a song that he wrote. And it was just so beautiful and it touched me so much and, and it really showed me lyrically how much he truly cared about people. He really loved people. And he had such a childlike way about doing so. And, and we did this project together. And the song, Ride Out the Storm, it, it just really says it all. Sometimes I get weary Just wanna lay
I learned in seminary that sacred worship services, orders of service, are to be on an incline. That they start low, but they continue to rise. And so we're coming to the height of this celebration of the life of Grant Woods, where there will be three persons who will offer eulogies. The root word for eulogy simply means to bless. When you eulogize someone, you are blessing that person's life, and you are blessing those who are listening to the eulogy. Three persons will offer eulogies. Charles Barkley, Ambassador Cindy McCain, and the beloved wife of Grant Marlene Galan Woods. Following Cindy McCain's eulogy, Niels Lofgren will come and sing Miss You Grant. And after Marlene finishes her eulogy, Deborah Lippman will sing Amazing Grace. I said at the beginning of this service that we must endeavor to be celebrative, sincere, sacred, somewhat serious, silly at times, and certainly sensational. And with the three persons who are going to offer eulogies, we will get all of that. <laughs> A famous black preacher is known for saying this, get ready, get ready, get ready. Get ready for the first eulogist, Charles Barkley. This is hard. And it sucks. Plain and simple. I love basketball. I love basketball. Basketball has given me every single thing in my life. Everything. Probably the greatest thing is Arizona. Thank y'all. Uh, trust me, there's not a lot of black kids from a of a couple thousand people thinking they're going to end up in Arizona, but I, did. but I did. But the best thing it gave me is relationship and friends, which is why I'm up here today. Uh, Grant Woods was my friend. He was my friend. I got traded here in 1992, and I remember Cod Fitch Simmons said to me, the Attorney General wants to meet you. <laughs> and I said, Cotton, I haven't even got arrested in Arizona yet. <laughs> and, and he says, no, he's a big, he plays basketball. I said, he does? And I said, well, I would love to. So we go, and he says, but you got to do it on a Friday. And I'm like, why on a Friday? Because he plays basketball every Friday. <laughs> and I said, okay, let's make it happen. So we go out, and I'm looking, I'm like, this dude's the attorney general, and he's trying to play basketball. <laughs> and it was awesome. It was flat out awesome. When we got together afterwards and had some lunch, and he says, what do you think? I said, what do you mean? What do I think? <laughs> and I said, he says, what do you think about me as a basketball player? <laughs> I said, well, uh, as an attorney general, you're a great attorney general. <laughs> I said, as a basketball player, you're a great attorney general. <laughs> uh, and from that day forward, we just started hanging together. It was awesome. Uh, just getting together for dinner. We had some amazing dinners. And we never talked politics. We never talked politics. 
Somebody said it earlier. He didn't care if you're a Democrat, Republican, or whatever. He, he judged you on your own individual merits. I admired that and I respected that. I admired that and respected that. You shouldn't have to be a Democrat or Republican. We're just all human beings. We're all in this thing together. I will tell you. <laughs> dinners were always awesome. Everybody was having a great time until about 20, 30, 45 minutes in, we had to tell Grant, Grant, you can't just monopolize the whole night talking about your kids. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, man, quit talking about your kids. We're here too. <laughs> it's so awesome that he loved his kids so much. He loved those kids so much. But we did have to tell him to shut the hell up. <laughs> we want to talk about other subjects. And the second thing was, Grant, we're not going to talk about basketball either. I don't know about, I'm not going to badmouth that player or that player or that player. He said, you think he can play? I said, no, I don't think he can play, but I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> I'm going to miss those conversations. I'm going to miss the, the dinners. I'm going to miss the text. I mean, sometimes when you're just sitting around your house doing nothing and you get a text, you just like start laughing. I mean, like, you heard some, one of the sons say, I hope nobody get to get into my texts or grant or emails because we could get in trouble in today's society. But they are hilarious. They are hilarious. I just I want to say, man, to be an amazing father, to have an amazing father, to get you started out in the right way must be special. I did not have that. I was raised by a single mother and grandmother, two amazing ladies. Uh, but to have a great father, to teach men how to be men and how to teach the women how they should be treated, that's amazing and remarkable. That's amazing and remarkable. And when I got the text the other day from a friend, my heart was aching, and I was like, wow. And now I've had a chance to sit back and, you know, okay, I'm gonna have to try to find a positive out of this situation. It was very difficult and very hard. But I do get to say to myself, I did get Grant in my life for 30 years. 30 years is a, a, a long time. It's a long time. It's not long enough. I understand that and I know that. I do. I do understand that and I know that. But there's very few people that you meet in your life that really like, that's a good person. I'm gonna miss that person. There's very few people that you really say about, I'm gonna miss Grant. I'm gonna miss our dinners. I'm gonna miss my, the great text he sent me. But more importantly, I'm gonna miss my friend, Grant Woods. You know, there's a couple of people close to me know that these things right here, they actually just paper. Grant's going to be number seven. I carry six of these around with me all the time. And it's going to be number seven. And it's seven people, um, I think my mother, my grandfather, my mother, my grandmother, two grandfathers, uh, Meadowlark Lemon, Paul Westfall, and I think uh, I'm missing somebody because it's seven total. But I'm going to put this in my travel bag because I never want to forget that person. And my friends, I'm like, yo, man, you're going to put those somewhere and not remember them. I said, well, the part of my bag I keep them in is where I keep all my cheap snacks. <laughs> so, I'm always going to be cheating when I'm supposed to
supposed to be on the diet. So every time I open up my little pack, my little pocket, I won't be, I'm gonna think about this, and this is gonna make me laugh. Because you've heard all the stories today. There's not a single person who's been around Grant Woods who didn't laugh, who did not laugh. I want to thank every single person here today because you guys took time out of your life to honor Grant. I mean that sincerely. Every single person here today could have been doing something else. I want to thank every single person in here for taking time out of their life to be here, and I'm honored to be here. To the family, hey, there's nothing anybody can say. There's nothing anybody can say. But I can say I was blessed to have Grant in my life. And thank you, God, for sharing him with me. Bless you. Grant first. I know you want to have a, an uplifting uh, memorial here, and I'm going to give it my best shot to cut me some slack. <laughs> like many of you, I'm having a hard time accepting Grant's passing. It's so hard to believe that he's gone. Hard to believe that a presence as bright as Grant's has been extinguished. But a voice as clear, amusing, and often wise as Grant's has been stilled too soon, way too soon. Many, many people who are blessed to call Grant their friend will long mourn his absence from our daily lives. How much harder it would, would be for those whom Grant most loved and who most loved him. Marlene, Austin, Lauren, Cole, Dylan, and Ava. I hope your grief is partly assuaged by the knowledge that your husband and father knew the greatest fulfillment anyone can have in life, to love and to be loved in return. And may his memory, memory remain a vivid, lasting presence in your lives. As you all know, Grant and my husband were great friends. Except for our marriage, their friendship was probably the longest relationship John had with an Arizona. Grant was John's very first campaign advisor in the state and his first chief of staff. But from the beginning of their association, they were close friends more than associates. Grant was one of John's favorite people on the planet. He was one of my favorites too. Human nature seeks the company of like-minded, like minds and compatible personalities. And John and Grant had a lot of common attributes and attitudes. Like John, Grant was great company, a gregarious, lively presence in the lives of his family and friends. Like John, he was funny and fun-loving. Grant could cheer you up no matter how discouraged you might be feeling at that time. In tough times, especially during the course of John's illness, no one was better at lifting up our spirits and livening things up than Grant. If John seemed a little down now, now and again, I would just make a phone call. And nothing would change his mood quicker than letting him know that Grant had called and was on his way up for a visit. John would light up at the news whatever pain and discomfort or indignity that had been troubling him at that time would take a back seat to his eagerness to see his old, dear friend. Their conversations weren't much different from the kind of conversations old friends typically have. They joke and tease each other, and as time grew short, tell each other how much they loved each other. They talk politics, but not much more than people who don't work in politics talk about it. They talked about family and mutual friends, about local news, 
They gossip like little girls also. <laughs> but more than any other subject, they would talk about sports, mostly about their beloved Cardinals, D-backs, Coyotes, and Suns. Like John, Grant loved sports. I know that's news to all of you. <laughs> and I mean he loved sports. John used to joke with Grant that each of them would stay up past midnight to watch the bedwetters play the thumb suckers if it was the only game on TV. <laughs> they were often photographed at games together, and the sheer joy on their faces reminded you of a couple of little kids at their first professional sporting event. Like John, Grant was a fan's fan. And like every true fan, he didn't mind sharing his opinions about the teams he loved and how well or not so well they were being managed. <laughs> As with John's more candid observations, not everyone was always super happy to hear those opinions. But, they never, never, but that never diminished the pleasure that they took in expressing them. Honestly, I think it might have added to it. <laughs> Like John, Grant was a, was a genuine Renaissance man, a musician, a songwriter, a playwright who truly loved the fine arts. Okay, that was BS. <laughs> but John loved a good song and liked to go to the movies. But his appreciation for the performing arts didn't extend much further than Ferris Bueller's Day Off or Abba. <laughs> But he admired people who had the talent to express themselves artistically. And John was impressed by, by and proud of his friend's many talents. Both Grant and John truly loved this state, loved its beauty and its people, and the independence and forthrightness that are common values here. Grant was, all, was a native Arizonan and John envied Grant's lifelong connection to the state and admired his natural possession of its values. Grant was authentic, and there, were, there was no attribute John more appreciated in a political figure, or in anyone for that matter, than authenticity. They were the real deal. There was, there was nothing phony or effective about either of them. They were themselves, always even in situations when it was shrewder or safer to be more guarded. They didn't know how to be anyone else. They never wanted to be anyone else. And that desire to be true to themselves and honor the people who had helped form their character marked their conduct in public office. They were conviction politicians, and they had the courage for it. They stood for what they believed was, the, was in the public interest, and even when it jeopardized, jeopardized their own personal interests. And they scorned people in public life who put themselves before the good of their constituents for the country. I think more than anything else, that was the shared attribute that brought them close, and that each other admired this so much in the other. They knew right from wrong, they had the guts to say so, even when others were pretending ignorance. Sadly, these are times when the kind of humility and conscientiousness in politicians aren't as common as they might once have been. They might be scorned by some contemporaries as foolish risks. Others might resent the vague pain of conscience, the example of better public servants provokes in weaker hearts. Still others, wrapped in a tight cocoon of self-interest, might be merely puzzled that they, were, they, are the, that they are public figures who are in, in the profession to serve causes greater than them. Suffice to say, our politics today does not produce so many examples of these stout hearts and devotion to duty, to community, to state, to country, and humanity. And we don't sharply feel the loss of every single one. We still have them in our lives when their voices are part of the public debates and their wit punctures the pomposity of self-inflated contemporaries. It's hard to lose hope that good people are still prominent in public life. 
When one of those voices is still, we have to hold on to the hope by holding on to the memory of their example, by honoring it, and trying to be the best we can to emulate it. It was a privilege. It was a privilege to know Grant Woods. It was a privilege to have watched the, and witnessed his and John's friendship, and, and their mutual admiration, and their shared love of Arizona and America. I'm going to cling to the memory of that as hard as I can, make sense of this crazy world, and to find joy in life that they always found and believed remained abundant everywhere you looked. At John's funeral, Grant closed his eulogy by paraphrasing St. Paul's second letter to Timothy. And I think the appreciation to Grant I think the appreciation applies to Grant as much as it did to his old friend. Rest in peace, Grant, my dear, my dear friend. But you fought the good fight. You finished the race. You kept the faith. Please say hi to John and give him a hug for me. Thank you.
I was 25 years old when I was introduced to a guy named Grant Woods. I had just moved to Phoenix from Florida. Young, ambitious reporter. I'd done my homework on the political scene. This was 1988 during the Mecham years. And nothing sounded appealing about going out with a Republican from Arizona. <laughs> But my sweet friend Elizabeth, who also was a reporter in town, convinced me that he was one of the normal ones. <laughs> he was Senator McCain's first chief of staff and a friend of the family. I liked John McCain. He was a Barry Goldwater kind of Republican. I liked Barry Goldwater. So, 25-year-old me went on my first and last blind date. Grant and Fred picked Elizabeth and I up from her apartment. I was so nervous. They came in, I was introduced. He had the bluest eyes and the most beautiful hands. We got into his fancy Jaguar, and they took us to El Choro on Lincoln, the old one, you know, before they remodeled it. <laughs> and they'd saved the most beautiful table next to the fireplace. And we had a beautiful dinner, it was fun, great food and drinks, and, and then we went over to Timothy's, and those of you who have been here long enough know about Timothy's, and that's where you wind up to go listen to some good music. And um, I was thinking, gosh, I think I kind of like this guy. He's handsome, he's, he's funny, he's sweet, he's, he's funny. I mean, I just, I, I think, yeah, I'm not going to get this everything. He's, he's great. I thought, you know, I think I can go out another time with this Republican from Arizona. <laughs> but... Uh, Grant sealed the deal on our way home. Inside his fancy Jaguar, there was a fancy cell phone. And in 1988, that was unheard of. So I was very impressed. He, uh, he put it on speaker, and he phoned the governor at his home. Evan Megham answered the phone. And Grant, in what is 100% an inappropriate accent that I will not torture you with, <laughs> pretended to be Ben Wenfong from the San Francisco Chronicle. <laughs> and the three of us are dying. He says to the governor, Governor, your story is not getting out. We need to get a better story out, Governor. How can I help you? And, and Meekum. Yes, you're right, you're right, I need a better story, I need a better story. Ben, maybe you can, you can write it for me. And Grant would say, Governor, you're getting hosed. You are getting hosed. And Miko, you're right, I'm getting hosed. I'm getting hosed. And this just went on, and, and finally we're laughing so hard that Grant has to hang up. And, uh, well, what can I tell you? That did it for me. <laughs> I had no idea what a gift you would be. Thirty-three years, most of my life, I've known Grant Woods. I've learned so much from him. He was the most generous person I have ever met. He gave away his time. 
He gave away his money. He gave away his name for the right cause. He lived a life bigger than himself. You know, he had good examples. His parents, Joe and Nina Woods, they showed him how to give more than take. He had the best role model in Senator McCain, his friend, who sacrificed so much, who lived a life for others. There really is no greater joy. And he passed this way of living along to me, to our children, to anyone who knew him. One of the greatest honors that I have had in these past three awful weeks has been that I have heard from a few young women who know our family, who told me how much they admired our marriage. One girl in particular said to me that she had never been able to be free to really be herself until she found our family, that she didn't have the best look at a marriage until she met us. And she told me that, she told her friends, I want to be like Grant and Marlene. That uh, really just brought me to my knees. Our marriage wasn't perfect, but damn, it was pretty close. He loved me so much. He wanted me by him all the time. But he understood that I needed time alone to work, to create, to write, to think, to make sense of this world that we live in. He loved his children so much, our little family that we created together. He loved all of you. You're so unique, each and every one of you. He was so proud of you, your talents, your accomplishments. But I will tell you what, the thing he was most proud of for your kind hearts and the love you have for each other. You've heard it said here today, Grant was an artist. He loved music. He learned how to play the guitar when he was 50 years old. And he began composing immediately. And he was unstoppable. Music defined my husband in so many ways. cried when John Stewart died. He wept when we lost John Prine. These were his heroes, along with Chris and Lucinda, Merle, Bruce, so many. Oh, that man read everything, everything. He had such an enormous capacity to absorb material. And not just intellectually, but in his heart. He had such an appreciation for beautifully written books and poetry and, and theater and music. And I was just lucky enough to be the girl he wanted to share it all with. He read to me all the time. new poem, an obscure story he'd read in a small town newspaper about a remarkable person and something they'd done. 
things I never would have known. And he's always been a writer. Even before I met him, he had written short stories, a novella, a treatment for a TV pilot. He had meetings at Warner Brothers. And, and then later, he wrote a novel and a few plays. And he was, he just had a table read the Tuesday before he passed away in Los Angeles on a new play he was working on. And now I'm finding out that he was working on at least two or three other things I, I didn't even know. He sang all the time. We sat up in his study all the time. He would play me the songs that he'd written, and he'd play me the songs he hadn't written that he loved. He loved his audience of one. And I loved my one man band. You know, Bob Dylan said, anything worth thinking about is worth singing about. Grant Woods thought all the time. He could barely sleep just thinking all the time. So it makes sense that he was constantly writing and constantly singing. I'm so grateful for the trips we took. We went to a lot of places. But the islands and Italy were his favorite things. It was probably one of the only things we argued about. And I wanted to go to exotic places. And he just like, no, I just the beach or Italy. <laughs> so we went a lot to the beach and to Italy. On our last trip to Anguilla, which was his favorite island, people there are so beautiful. We sat down for dinner and the waiter admires Grant's Hawaiian shirt and he just goes on and on. It's a beautiful shirt, that yellow, it looks really great on you. And <laughs> he leaves, comes back with drinks and then Grant starts to compliment this guy's shirt. That pink, that's so great on you. That looks really, it's very fun. There were like two girls in the dressing room with sacks. And they just went on and on talking about each other's shirts. And before I knew it, they were undressing in the restaurant, swapping shirts. I mean, we just had so, it was so much fun. I mean, who does that? Grant went to Cuba in the 90s and um, was walking around in Havana by himself one day when he ran into a bunch of boys playing baseball. Well, if that wouldn't melt my husband's heart, I don't know what would. So he got to know them, he played with them a while. They, they played baseball with a stick and a rock that had tape over it. After a while, Grant said, hey, where, where can we go? get a real bat and ball. And they're like, man, this is really... And, and of course, it's Grant talking to them in the broken Spanish that I had tried to pass along to him. But they figured it out, and the boys seemed really expensive. Got to go down a few blocks. So Grant, I said, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm in search of it. 20 blocks later, three stores, four stores, he finally comes back with the ball and bat. And he says to them, okay, Two conditions for this gift. Number one, everyone must be allowed to play. You can't exclude anyone. And number two, you must forever be known as the Arizona Diamondbacks. <laughs> now, that was in the 90s. Given recent events, I think he might have given them a different team name. <laughs> Maybe the Giants or the Red Sox, right? Florence, Italy was his favorite place in the whole world. A lot of people around here repeatedly asked Grant to run for office. He just wanted to be mayor of Florence. 
Grant surrounded with himself with amazing people, and I've always known that, but in the last few weeks, that has solidified itself for me in a way that I will carry with me forever. These are people. You are people who are loyal, loyal friends and colleagues of character. You know, Grant was the best friend you could have. You wanted him in your corner, and he did not suffer fools well. We know he wasn't shy about saying what was on his mind, saying the thing that everybody else could barely have the courage to think. I have never known anyone, anyone with such an unflinching sense of right and wrong. His moral compass could not be shaken. His heroes were Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., John McCain, John Rose. These are the people who he modeled his life after. To say that my husband led an extraordinary life is an understatement. He embraced everything. The things he loved, he loved completely. We know he loved sports. He loved playing sports. He liked watching sports. He was so competitive. I've heard some stories about how his tennis racket would slip out of his hand. <laughs> I'm sure that his hands were sweaty. I would hear him in the other room watching a game, and I mean to tell you, this could be the little league, major league, like the little league uh, big game, whatever they're called. And he was screaming at the TV because it was there was a bad call. And you'd think he just had owned the little league team. I mean, this is how he was. It was, it was hilarious. And um, I'm just going to... God, I'm, go I'm just going to miss him screaming at the TV. <laughs> at the theater, he was equally passionate. We were lucky enough this past August for my birthday to be in New York and to see Bruce Springsteen on stage. And there he was, my big, strong, beautiful man, weeping at the truth and the beauty of Bruce's songs and story. That's what I'll miss most his humanity. My husband got life. He was passionate. He understood what counted. And to make a difference in the life of someone was at the top of the list to fight for the average person without a voice. It's why he fought for civil rights as attorney general. It's why he fought for a paid Martin Luther King Day along with Pastor Stewart. It's why he stood up to the police in Chandler when they were racially profiling undocumented immigrants. And his latest passion, his last fight, is probably the most important. The most dire. Stopping voter suppression in the United States of America. It is a cancer. It's a cancer that is spreading in legislatures around our country. These are laws specifically crafted to keep minorities from voting. Grant felt that protecting an American's right to vote was imperative for our fragile democracy. He worked every day since the inauguration with a bipartisan group working to protect our most fundamental right, the right to vote. I received a letter from Joanna Lidgate just a few days ago the CEO of States United. 
Their group had their last call on Wednesday, their first one without Grant. She wrote to me, Grant was a beloved member of our team. We loved watching him speak truth to power and we will all benefit from his wisdom, bravery, and steadiness. Thank you for sharing Grant with us. We will miss him terribly and we will do our best to carry on the mission as we know he would want us to. And we will carry on that mission. Grant's death shaken. This unspeakable loss has shaken my strength and frankly my faith in God. About two days after he passed, I sat outside on my porch with my coffee and he's a bird feeder out by the fountain and during COVID and the lockdown, he had gotten into attracting lovebirds. They came by the droves. And um, this year we hadn't seen very many. He blamed the weather, or our absence. We were in California, or out of town a lot. It's so a bleary eyed. That morning I went out there and I cleaned out the bird cage and I put fresh seed in it. And uh, I hung it up. And out loud, in my yard, in my pajamas, I looked up to Jesus and I said, please, I just need one love bird. I just need one to know that Grant's okay. And the next morning, I go back out there, my coffee, dang it, one lovebird shows up. And the next morning, five. God is good. God is good. Jesus, you just, um, that little miracle, that little miracle, has given me the faith to know that this man, your servant, is with you. And his parents, and his heroes, and his friends. The Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, would recognize Grant Woods as his follower. I found this poem on the mantle of our bedroom the day after he died. It's been there for God knows how long, and I finally just picked it up and, and looked at it. And this is what it said. It was written by Chief Seattle, who died in 1866. And this is this torn little piece of paper Grant had found somewhere. Humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread in it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. All things are bound together. To love and to be loved. That is the greatest gift. And that's why this hurts so much. Grant was loved completely. I loved him completely. I was the luckiest girl to be introduced to Grant Woods.
sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious was that grace appear the hour I first. Bright shining as the sun, we no less days to sing God's praise than when we first. Please join me in singing the first verse of Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Love you, Grant. The Woods family would like to thank you for your gracious act of sympathy and tribute in honor of J. Grant Woods. Following the closing prayer, the FIBC worship team will come and sing its final closing song. Once that song is finished, the family of Grant Woods will exit. So we'd like everyone to remain seated until the family exits. And once they have exited, you may be free to God, we thank you for this remarkable human being, Grant Woods. He was big, so big that he cannot be categorized. He was a multifaceted person that you made in your image and likeness. Thank you that he was who he was. We pray no longer for Grant. Grant is with you. But we do offer our prayers for Marlene, children, the rest of the family, those who work closely with Grant. We pray that when we reflect upon his life, that we will be inspired to endeavor to live the fullest that we may know. We thank you that Grant was a man of faith, a follower of Jesus Christ. And so we know that his life transitioned, but his life will live forever. We ask our grace to be upon each and every one of us from this day forth. And I pray this prayer in the name of my Savior, Grant's Savior, even Jesus the Christ. 
all the people said together, Amen.